Hello, good morning and welcome to the AMUs with me, Mopisa Sibidi. Now, on our first story, the Sir North Member of Parliament, Joe Quayson, whose election in December last year has been annulled by a Cape Coast High Court, could end up being charged with perjury. The court, presided over by Justice Kwesi Boache, did not only annul the results of the 2020 parliamentary election in the Constitution, constituency, but also ordered fresh elections to be conducted in that constituency. Following the ruling on Wednesday, the New Patriotic Party's Central Regional Secretary has filed a complaint with the Police Criminal Investigations Department to investigate Joe Quayson. Um, Richard Kojunyako reports. Reading the 55-page judgment in front of a packed court, the judge, Justice Kwesi Boachi, said the MP, Joe Jachi Kwesi, violated constitutional provisions and other statutory provisions that guide Ghana's elections. Consequently, he cancelled the 2020 parliamentary elections that were conducted in the Asin North constituency and ordered for a fresh election to be conducted. By the court's order, Mr. Jachi Kwesi should not hold himself out as the MP for the Asin North. Before the orders of the court, the judge took time to deal with the four issues that were set down for trial. On the issue of the capacity of the petitioner to maintain an action against the Asin North MP, the judge said the petitioner had the capacity and the petition was competent as well. The judge accordingly overruled the MP's challenge of the petitioner's capacity. The court explained that each jurisdiction could be invoked in an election petition when the EC conducts a parliamentary election and declares the result of the contest. Thus, he argued the court's jurisdiction was properly invoked. On the second issue, on whether or not the EC aired in the discharge of its duties and allowed Mr. George Achikwesin to file his nominations, the judge also indicated the independence of the EC in the conduct of elections in Ghana was not in doubt and the courts won't interfere in the operations of the EC unless an illegality and an unconstitutionality are being perpetrated by the EC. The third issue on when Article 94-2A kicks in, the judge said based on the certificate the MP submitted in his affidavit in response to the petition, he only seems to be a Canadian citizen on November 26, 2020 and not any period before or at the time of filing to contest the elections. The court indicated that the evidence on the face of the certificate destroys the case of the Asin North MP. According to the judge, it would be a bad precedent and a cancerous tumor in Ghana's legal jurisprudence should the court allow that to happen. On the final issue on whether or not the election of the Asin North MP is null and void, the judge said the MP violated the constitutional provisions and other statutory provisions that guide Ghana's elections, and so the elections were null and void. A member of the NDC's legal team, Alex Sebefia, says it was a travesty of justice and the NDC would deal with the case to its logical conclusion. He asks, should there be a by-election, the NDC would still win the seat. He says you must be a citizen of Ghana. If you are not a citizen of Ghana, you cannot hold certain positions. You cannot hold this position. Uh, president, you cannot be uh, a chief of defense staff, etc., etc. And in 94-2, he says you cannot be an MP if you do not, if you owe allegiance. There's a big difference between allegiance and citizenship. And sometimes they are mutually exclusive. This was never addressed in this case. This is part of the reason we wanted to go to the Supreme Court and we went and were given certain instructions and part of the applications we were going to do today was for this matter to be halted for the Supreme Court to make an adjudication similar to what they did in Zanetto 94-1 to be done with 94-2 so that we know exactly what the outcome would be with regard to uh, this type of a scenario. To circumvent that and not let the Supreme Court have a say on this matter, we think is unfortunate. So it's not a question of delay or the election petition. It's a question of what is right. The bottom line is, what did the people of Asin not want? They wanted our candidate to be their representative. So if there is a problem, make sure you take time to actually ensure that truly, truly, there had been some problem and therefore he could not. That is not the case. And that is why we are minded at this stage to look at the judgment closely. The legal rep of the petitioner and MPP's national youth organizer, Henry Nanabuachi, says the judgment is a victory for the rule of law. We are of the view that this is victory for rule of law. And again, we will be waiting for the Electoral Commission's announcement on when the said by elections will be conducted. Let me also state 
that we in the MPP, we believe in the rule of law. We have heard from our friends in the NDC that we are using some technicalities to make sure that the sovereign will of the people of Asin North will be thwarted. This is false and malicious attempt by the ND NDC to render our rule of law ineffective, but it is not going to work. Now, I said the last time that the same law that found Honorable Adamu Sakande as not eligible to be member of parliament for Boko Central is the same law applicable as we speak. The matter that was before the High Court was of a civil nature and thus the court awarded a cost of 40,000 Ghana cities against the Asinod MP, 30,000 Ghana cities to the petitioner and 10,000 Ghana cities to the Electoral Commission. Reporting from the Cape Coast High Court for Joy News, Richard Kwejenyako. Now the Ghana Health Service is warning there is a high risk of a severe third wave worse than the second wave if the disregard for the COVID-19 protocols continues. Speaking at a news briefing in Accra Wednesday, Director General of the Service, Dr. Patrick Kumar Waje, made it clear Ghana is currently going through a third wave of the virus outbreak. We are experiencing a third wave, a major spike that can be described as a third wave. There's a high risk that the severe third wave may have a higher, uh, severe, much more severe wave compared to the second, if nothing is done. And this is happening because we are also still not adhering to the protocols. And we would have expected a lot more people adhering to the protocol, but we've still not seen enough. We're going to start the mask surveys to see how people respond and how it relates to the, de the decline or otherwise of the numbers. We still have to look for more isolation centers if the surge is continuing. We are also non adherence to isolation by affected persons undergoing home treatment, and that's why we are enforcing more uh, facility isolation. And of one of the key challenges we are having is the fact that we still, our vaccination coverage is still low. You said the last one that we talked about, the third wave, and that we're being evasive. There's a very, very classical definition for a wave. Until you get there, you don't say it. In a wave, you see a stepwise increase in numbers. When you have an increase that is stagnating, that is not a wave yet. And so it was not being evasive. We're just telling you what it is. Now we can see we are seeing an increase, so we can now move in. So we don't going to jump in. People are saying we are there. Forecasting is different from saying this is where uh, we, we are. Meanwhile, police in the Ashanti region have intensified enforcement of public wearing of face masks to help curb the spread of COVID-19 cases in the greater Kumase area. This has become necessary due to a surge in cases there. Love Affairs Mona Lisa from Pong visited the Central Business District and reports security personnel have been deployed to ensure compliance. The Ashanti region has cumulatively recorded 17,898 COVID-19 positive cases with 297 deaths. With 1,135 active cases and the emergence of the highly transmissible Delta variant, health authorities are bracing up for a third wave of COVID-19. Edum, Kwadaso and Ofurikrom are the hot spots for the transmission of the Delta variant in Kumasi. Non-compliance to the wearing of nose mask has been high in the central business district of Kumasi. This has necessitated the deployment of security personnel to major entry points of the Kedetia market to enforce compliance. Refusal to wear the mask will not guarantee one's entry into the market. After a few altercations, recalcitrant individuals are compelled by the security officers to buy and wear the mask.
Some residents of Kumasi explained to Love News how they are adhering to the safety protocols. If after the president's address, I can see a number of people wearing masks. It's just a matter of time. People will refuse to wear it. First week in the I will wear the nose mask to protect myself. myself against that virus diseases. No, by security forums the security personnel are doing a good job. They are ensuring people wear the mask. XWO1 Michael Sosa is a security coordinator at the Keditia market. He observes most individuals only wear the mask after the president has addressed the nation. He assures the public of strict supervision to ensure both traders and customers at the Keditia market comply with the safety protocols. When the COVID was not flowing as per the way it was, um, the wearing of the nose mask also reduces. People decided not to even wear the nose mask. But uh, when the president came, that was the, the last time that the president came with it, I think now people are making good use of uh, the nose mask. So for me, I foresee um, when we are able to educate, or the media comes out with a very good uh, uh, educa uh, educative programs, uh, people will do the right thing. <laughs> People who refuse to wear the mask, whether in public or in vehicles, must be arrested. Okay, so sure. Well, mainly wearing this mask is to protect you from others and others from you. From Kumase for Joy News, Mona Lisa Frimpong. Back here in Accra, as the Finance Minister prepares to present the 2021 Mid-Year Budget Review Statement to Parliament, the minority is asking him to clearly spell out his plan to deal with the country's rising debt. They are also asking for a clear plan on how to combat growing hardship in the country. NDC MP on the Finance Committee, Ben Bodo, says the economy needs immediate salvaging. He says more needs to be done to cut down on government spending. No, me is. So I will expect that the minister will come tomorrow and be truthful to the nation. Already we've got snippets of information about the shortfalls in revenue, uh, which were estimated to be realized within the first five months. He should be truthful to, to us and tell us the reasons why these shortfalls are coming. And what measures the, the government will adopt to, to stem these uh, reductions in our revenue expectations. And then, and then the borrowing, which has landed us into very severe debt risk situation, should, we should find a way of, uh, you know, um, curtailing the borrowing. And then institute measures to start the redemption of our uh, uh, debt. You know, in the, f the former government, the, 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 uh, during September's period, we created the sinking fund. But MPP MP on the Finance Committee, Stephen Amor, says the current debt situation is better than what the NDC left in 2016. He blames the situation on COVID-19 and assures the government is committed to dealing with the debt situation. The capitalist, we are going to give the best that Ghanaians are expecting to harmonize these areas, create more jobs, reduce standard of living, sorry, reduce cost of living, increase standard of living, and making sure that we consolidate 
we restore and continue with our debt levels within manageable framework in the very near future. We'll do all these things. What would you expect to hear from the finance minister on that bit in terms of the debt management? Your colleagues are warning that um, at the current rate we are spending up to 85% of revenue paying back debt. They think that by 2023 we may not even be able to pay back our debt. What will you hope the finance minister deals but, with? But do you know our colleagues have taken us to over 140% debt to GDP ratio before and we lived. Go and check the year 2020, uh, uh, 2000. When the NDC, they were hang, handing over power to us, our debt to GDP was over 140%. Did we die? So what are they talking about? But if, if you talk about, about change, that is increment in terms of our debt portfolio, they've done worse than us. Go and check. Every four years, go and check debt increment. But the debt to GDP is unfortunate because we are not growing. And we are not growing because productivity has been on hold. You know what is happening in the whole world and in Ghana. Revenue generation is down. You know, industries are not operating that they used to. Trading activities are not. So definitely these are key functions of GDP. And if they are key functions of GDP, and because of natural disaster or global crisis, they are not growing and we are spending, debt to GDP will be this. Even with us, we've done our, our best. I think under NDC, would have been about 600. Would we? And that's it for the AM News. For more news, you can log on to myjoyonline.com. My name is Rupita Sibidi, and the AM Show continues. Oh, a very good morning to you again if you're just joining us. Of course, this is the AM Show. Thanks to MAPS for bringing us the AM News. She's back on air tomorrow, God willing, on the AM Show. Uh, let's do the newspapers. I've got to say good morning to Joseph Kofi from Pong, Akable. Where are you? Let me see your face. There you are. Hello, good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you? Not bad. Nice. Uh, Joseph Opokugapo is expected to join us. Uh, maybe his alarm failed, uh, but if it didn't and he's up, he will join us and honor his presence when he does. Uh, but Joe, tell me about how your day went yesterday. It wasn't bad. I mean, I was monitoring what was happening in Cape Coast quite closely, and I think it was a quite a major decision that came out there. Yeah, absolutely. I was just looking at the beginning of uh, that judgment. It says 64 page means the judge did a lot of, a lot of work uh, on, on what he had. I'll open up what he began with, which was rather very interesting, Joseph. He talks about the Nelson Mandela the, the Nelson, quote. Yeah, exactly, the Nelson Mandela quote. But also brings about the issue of Jacob Zuma's contempt of courts. Uh, what has sent him to prison. I found that very, very interesting as his, uh, you know, the opening remarks before he went on into delivering the judgment. Uh, but I guess we'll come to all the details of uh, this uh, judgment that was delivered yesterday, scotting the entire country talking. Uh, let's, let's hear the papers that you will be going through, Akable. So I'm going to do the front page of uh, the Daily Dispatch. I have the Ghanaian Times as well. Then as we proceed, I'll add a few others. OK. All right. So why don't we just start? Let me start with the Daily Graphic newspaper. Obviously, uh, this issue is the biggest MPP NDC for my election with a question mark as Cape Coast Court announced a Sin North election. Mid-year budget today, Economist warns public sector inefficiencies tackled. President Kufuado commences his action on petition to remove Chief Justice. Also on the front page of the Daily Graphic newspaper. You'll see that in a bit. Uh, but in the center spread of the paper, it says, Stan Chats post strong financial performance in 2020. Uh, award to honor excellence in credit risk practices launched. Group wants more investments in vulnerable communities. An access bank opens digital branch on UPSA campus. 
if you turn our attention uh, so that's the center spread of the paper what i just reviewed can we take a look at the front page so our viewers can appreciate how the front page looks like that's it uh i don't know why they're still asking the question when the court has ruled but i guess it's because we know that the the parties would head to the court of appeal to appeal this decision uh, the back page of the paper now, immigration to run COVID-19 test for work permit applicants. State to return vested lands to owners. Why does this headline sound so familiar? Like I've seen it and heard it before, maybe twice or so. The fact that lands which have been vested in the state will be given back to their rightful owners under the administration of the new Land Act 2020. Uh, this is according to a Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Dr. Benito Owusubio. Details of that on the back page of the paper. Uh, Joe, let's hear what's in the Times. So first, the front page of the Ghanaian Times, uh, dual citizenship case, Asin North MP disqualified court orders EC to conduct fresh election and minority vows to contest election is also here. And no new taxes will be introduced as coming from the finance minister, Ken Ofriata, as he prepares to present the mid-year budget review. And uh, Opuni's case, Supreme Court stops judge from hearing 271 million city fertilizer deal cases also on the front page. And GHS, the Ghana Health Service, warns of severe third wave COVID-19 outbreak. It's another story on the front page. The back page has uh, this story about the Greater Accra Regional Minister visiting the Pokwasi interchange cautions wrongdoers. And uh, again, Achim Bieni community gets new library, ICT center is on the back page of the Ghanaian Times. All right, uh, so let's go through the Daily Guide newspaper. Uh, the Daily Guide newspaper on the front page says, NDC Canada, Canada in quotes MP asked by uh, uh, by election looms. It says AG briefs MPs on high profile murders. NDC grows reviving vigilante task force. Paper alleges opening judge pushed out. Koku Anidoho responds to sucking. And that's how the front page of the paper looks like with the headlines. Today in the center spread though, as we pay attention to what's on the News 1 pullout, which is usually the entertainment stories, it says MPP grows grab master's degrees. Uh, so you would see Odenehu Kwekwa Piaeni titles Glover. They were among the recently graduated students of the University of Professional Studies across Wasai politics. The two individuals put academic pursuit as frontline agenda, grabbing postgraduate degrees at the last weekend graduation where Vice President was a special guest. Well, uh, Ni Kwate Titus Glover is our friend, so we congratulate him on this. Uh, this is certainly good. School is really good. So anybody that pursues that, well, you've done well. So we wish you well and we congratulate you. There's, uh, let's see. Mr. Frank recruits strongman for, is it Chobi? This one there, I haven't been following it, but if it's one that you are interested in. Joseph, you know about this Chobi? No, uh, this is my first time hearing about it. Uh, if you don't know, dear, then me, I don't know. Cry. So. Well, as you always say, if you want to know, you know. <laughs> On the back page, Charlie, you guys, you won't keep quiet. You are still making promises. Kotoko constructs AstroTurf. <laughs> Okay, well, they can do, they can construct AstroTurf, but they are still out of the MT and FA Cup, and we won the league. Okay, but listen, that's just a joke. What they're doing is a good thing. Uh, Minister charges athletes to lift Ghana high, uh, and well, the, there's a challenger touts champion in WBO Africa Featherweight Championship. All right, there are some other stories on the back page. If you're, you're interested, you can grab the paper. And read some more. Joseph, do you have some more papers? Yes, I'll do quickly the front page of the Daily Dispatch, then I'll wrap up with that of the Business Finder. Daily Dispatch uh, reports that NPP likely to win Asin North by, by election. That is coming from Ben Epson. 
And so while someone is asking whether there will even be a buy, like she was a question mark, one of the papers you read there, we are being told that the MPP is likely to win at that by election that will take place. And see page 11 for the details. NDC planning to use violence towards 2024 elections is a question that is being asked. NPA chief executive wants OMCs not to flout the rules. And availability of vaccines and increasing infections were foremost on my mind. That's the health minister. The business finder reports this morning that stimulus package is critical to overcome ravages of pandemic, economists and donors speaking. And uh, the last one here is still on the front page. It says Ecobank, AUD, and NEPAD pass out over 200 NSME graduates. It's also on the front page of the business finder. That will be all for you, Malabi. Daily Statesman newspaper on the front page. NDC loses one seat in Parliament as court announced a St. North parliamentary elections. Uh, MPA boss charges OMC to play by the rules. Majority leader calls for consensus in Parliament. And Justice Honyanuga can't continue with opening case. He's been battling with this, trying to get him out. And finally, it has happened. So that's it for what's on the front page of the, the new, no, the Daily Statesman newspaper. Uh, Joe, any more? No, that, that'll be it for me by way of the front pages. Okay. So I guess we can get into details uh, of some of the stories. Where do you want to start from, Joseph? I mean, I think they are, they are seen, a seen uh, case. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. And um, it's interesting because, well, this is someone who had applied uh, wanting to contest for MP, and he had also applied to renounce his Canadian citizenship. Unfortunately, the certificate came after he had filed his nomination. And in filing his nomination, there are portions that you make a statutory declaration that you've met the eligibility criteria, that is, that you're a registered voter, and also that you don't owe allegiance to any other country. I mean, I have gone to the 64-page judgment. Mm -hmm. I agree completely with the judge. The angle of my concern is beyond what is in the case itself, and that is what Professor Sari in my opinion, did justice to on, on PMS Press last night. It's about the fact that we have equated allegiance to citizenship. And that is where the problem really is. Because if you pick Ghana's constitution, and, and anyone who picks any copy of the constitution, that you even pick up. Joseph, are you there? OK, I thought this was worked on, but apparently not. We need some other experts to help with that setup. Uh, Joseph Akable would continue with that angle. Uh, but I wanted to just read to you how the judge started uh, you know, this judgment. And he begins with a quotation from N Nelson Mandela, former president of South Africa. Uh, and he says, this, this is the quote. We expect you to stand on guard, not only against direct assault on the principles of the Constitution, but against insidious corrosion. Again, let me refer to the relevant portion of the introduction to the judgment of the South African Constitutional Court, dated 29th of June, 2021. Uh, this is the events that led Jacob Zuma to prison. So this is the quote. It is indeed the lofty and lonely work of the judiciary, impervious to public commentary and political rhetoric, to uphold, protect, and apply the Constitution and the law at any and all costs. The uh, corollary duty borne by all members of the South African society, lawyers, lay people, and politicians alike, is to respect and abide by the law and court orders issued in terms of it because unlike other arms of states, courts rely solely on the trust and confidence of the people to carry out their constitutionally mandated function. The matter before us has arisen because these important duties have been called into question and the strength of the judiciary is being tested. Uh, Joseph, are you back? Okay, so I was just going to say that when I read this, my mind just went to that interlocutory injunction that had been secured that was expected to, serve, to be served on the same member of parliament. Uh, there wasn't uh, any contempt charges afterwards. 
but my mind just went back to that. This was just the beginning uh, of the judgment. Before he went to that matter, he quoted what I just read to you, and that's what we're, we're scrolling on the screen. But as we know now, uh, the court has made a decision, and the parties that disagree have the option of going to the Court of Appeal. That's what the NDC uh, has said they will do. In the meantime, with regards to that portion of the provision, which is the Article 94-2A. Uh, there's also a citizen of Ghana who is seeking, um, you know, the, for the court to interpret that provision. Uh, you know, some would say that there are two meanings to it. Not everybody agrees that it is clear. Uh, there is no ambiguity. So we will see how that one also goes. But in the meantime, I guess we go, it's not even a guess, we go with what the court has said. The high court has decided, and so there will be a by-election until further notice. Uh, Joseph, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Mm. Okay. I was just reading the beginning of that judgment, uh, that uh, South African court, and I said my mind went to the injunction that was expected to be served on the member of parliament on the 7th of January, uh, that we know that that didn't happen and there were no contempt charges brought against him in that respect. But continue with yeah, I mean, what you were analyzing. There were no contempt charges. I mean, I think the point I was making was that the substantive challenge really is about the fact that we have equated allegiance to citizenship. And, and the point that Professor Asari makes, which is very important, when you pick any copy of the Constitution, what we see is that at the time that the Constitution was promulgated, it didn't allow for dual citizenship. And so it was illegal to be a dual citizen in Ghana. And we've amended that in the 90s to allow for us to be dual citizen. And his argument is that at the same time that the Constitution didn't allow dual citizens, it's required that if you are going to be a parliamentarian, you should not owe allegiance to any other country. And so his argument is that the drafters could not have been referring to being a dual citizen because the same document, one part of it said that you cannot be a dual citizen, and the other part of it said that if you want to be a, you don't owe allegiance to any other country. And subsequently, we've amended the part that does not allow dual citizenship to allow dual citizenship now. And so how then do you say that, okay, what didn't exist previously that we've now allowed it, it actually means what the other side is talking about. Mm. And, and, and that, I, I believe, is the, is the actual challenge. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a, it sounds like a theoretical concept, but the point really is that allegiance means be, you are loyal to a country. And so we are saying that you are very loyal to Ghana when you're Ghanaian. Then when you add Canadian citizenship, you know you are no longer loyal to Ghana. Mm, mm. And so that is the, the, the ideological debate that I side with people like Professor Asario. But in terms of this particular decision, I, I, I don't find any fault with it in the context of what it is, because the Supreme Court had indicated in the Zaneto case that the, the qualification relative to being 18 years a registered voter kicks in when you have filing nomination. Mm. And so I do not see any situation where the court will say that with that requirement, it kicks in when you have filing nomination and will conclude that for that of uh, being not owing allegiance, it will take place at some other time, rather than when you are filing nomination. Mm. I don't see how anyone will expect the mm. court to conclude differently. And I think, well, it may have been better if the court had referred it to the Supreme Court, which I believe would have come to the same conclusion anyways. Oh, okay. All right, interesting. I want to go back to some of the facts uh, in, in this judgment uh, with the timelines with regards the time when uh, application was put through for the renunciation. And the judge, uh, he, this is the line before... The, the timelines that I'm going to be reading. It says the facts as established from the pleadings and which are not disputed as follows. The first respondent in this case, which is the member of parliament, once held both Ghanaian and Canadian citizenship. On the 19th of December, 2019, first respondent through his lawyers wrote to the Canadian authorities to be mindful of the date, 19th of December, 2019. He wrote through his lawyers to the Canadian authorities to renounce his Canadian citizenship. He had his Canadian citizenship since 1983 and received permanent residence in 1979 and had since worked as an administrator in social studies. It goes on to say, 
between 5th and 9th October 2020, when the Electoral Commission opened and closed nominations to contest the parliamentary elections for the Asin North constituency, the MP filed his nomination forms with the EC to contest as such. Before the 7th December 2020 general elections organized by the Electoral Commission, a youth group known as Concerned Citizens of Asin North alleging that the NP owed allegiance to another country and other than Ghana, presented a petition to the EC on the grounds that he was not qualified to be a member of parliament. And note this, this is important because there are other people who are also blaming the electoral commission for not doing a thorough job because this had come to their attention and they did nothing about it. Well, they actually did because they, in a letter dated 24th of November, 2020 requested the MP to respond to the petition, which he did on the 26th of November 2020. The Canadian authorities wrote to approve. So he put in the application back in 2019, 19. and in 2020, uh, they wrote to approve the renunciation of his Canadian At the time, the EC was, was investigating the matter. Yes. So but but it, it's important that, I mean, I think the, what you can fault the EC for is the judgment quotes portions of the, the renunciation certificate. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's important to read that portion. It says that this is to certify that the person named above has formally renounced Canadian citizenship and pursuant to the Citizenship Act will cease to be a citizen on the 26th November 2020. Okay. His citizenship ceased on 26th November 2020. Okay. The filing of nomination was in October. He had applied the previous year, November. And so it meant that the Electoral Commission official that gave him the clearance ought to have seen that as at the time those statutory declarations were made and given to the EC, he was still a Canadian citizenship in law. So here's as well the issue. As amount to allegiance. Yeah, here's the, the issue. The argument I'm making that I don't think so. Okay, so I think this was also one of the issues that was raised. If the Electoral Commission, which is in this case is uh, the institution with that constitutional mandate to organize elections, did not see anything wrong with this, then why do you put the blame on the Member of Parliament? Because he had gone through the process. They, were, they, they had seen the certificate and they didn't raise issues. Do you get what I mean? Absolutely. That's, that's, I, I think that's a significant issue if anybody also raises that. That's significant because it they is, saw it, it and they didn't raise further issues on it. It is significant uh, to the extent that, I mean, the rules allow people to question, uh, raise, file an election petition. An election petition will obviously be filed after the elections. Mm. And so the EC clearing someone to contest does not bar anyone from filing an election petition post the election. True which in simple terms, one of the things that you can question is the eligibility of the person who contested and mm. acts of various reliefs, including annulment. And so, yes, he had gotten the EC's clearance prior, but then again, the option of the election petition was still appealed to the individual who wanted to raise it in this particular instance, the person did. And so that, that's why I'm, I'm saying that the main challenge I really have is how we've equated allegiance to citizenship. Mm. Because if we equate it that way, then per this document, that electoral commission official should have seen that the document was stating that the man ceased to be a Canadian on the 26th of November. And so if we are treating citizenship as being allegiance, it meant that in October when he made those declarations, he was not competent to, to contest. And what it actually means is that assuming that the Electoral Commission's nomination process was ending in, on 28th of November would have meant that he would have been qualified to contest. Mm. And one will ask the question that, I mean, what does the law seek to do? Does it seek to simply ensure that we have someone who is not dual citizenship, then at what point should it kick in? It obviously cannot be on December 7 because we'd have to check the process. It has to be prior. And so whatever will be prior would have to be a date that will be fixed by the Electoral Commission really. So clearly I mean, there's, it, it, there's a matter for the Supreme Court to, uh, to interpret. This provision is not clear. What happened, uh, was it two days ago, Joseph, uh, because they had gone to the Supreme Court, but we understand that the procedure that they used was wrong. So that so, matter was not determined. Yes, and so the Supreme Court had told them that they had not made a formal application at the High Court asking that the 94-2A should be referred to the Supreme Court for interpretation. And the Supreme Court said that had they made that application and it had been denied, 
they would then now come in and seek the supervisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And that is what Sami Jenfi was making reference to yesterday, that when they went to the high court yesterday morning, they tried to file that application, and the court officials had uh, abandoned post. <laughs> the application that they wanted to make, just to inform the judge that we want you to refer 92, 94 to A to the Supreme Court. And when they refuse, then they'll go higher up. Uh, to make the other application that the, the, the Supreme Court said is the process that they should use. And so mm. that is also another administrative bottleneck that came the yeah. way. Yeah, but the question I ask is why wait to get to that point? Because even if you want to use the Zanato case, uh, they use the same procedure. And it's, uh, I spoke to a few lawyers yesterday. It's a common thing that they do, even though in some cases they agree that sometimes the judge himself or herself uh, would allude to the fact that, yes, indeed, this is not clear enough, or the two of you are giving different meanings to it. So I want to refer I mean, to my mother to explain it, and then I'll come back and continue with the case. I mean, obviously, they, 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 we've seen it happen a few times, even in the Republic versus Eugene Buffalo Bonnie. When the arrival means the court can refer. Mm. But in this particular instance, if you read the judgment, the judge took the view that the Supreme Court, by interpreting 94-1, so they are just two, they are just provisions that are they follow each other. Mm -hmm. So one says you have to be a registered voter, and the other says you don't you shouldn't owe allegiance. And the judge took the view that the Supreme Court has interpreted that when you become a registered voter, that requirement kicks in when you are filing your nomination. Yeah, but, so but, but on that point, that I disagree because I think there are two different things. I personally yes. disagree. Yeah, you. I know you disagree. That's why I'm making the point that how a reasonable expectation could one have that the Supreme Court will say that you have to be a registered voter when I'm filing the nomination, but you have to owe allegiance at a different date. Then I'm asking the question, which date would that be? Mm, mm. It has to obviously be before December 7th. Because on December 7th, we cannot be checking those who have renounced their citizenship. It obviously cannot be on that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a practical impossibility. So yeah. It comes back to the same point that it will have to be a date fixed by the Electoral Commission. Wow. You have a point, though. Uh, let's, let's, Joseph Opokugako, finally the alarm worked, so he's awake. Uh, so, Joseph Opokugako, are you there? I've always been here. It's about um, internet <laughs> difficulties, Mama. You don't make it sound as though I'm the sleepy head. Oh, no, you are. Listen, okay, so what, what was, we, we want to gauge the mood, you know, as this decision was delivered yesterday. There were series of media engagements between the NDC and the NPP. But what was the talk? What were, what were you know, groupings talking about in Parliament? So to a certain extent, um, the NPP side feels vindicated by the development as we saw, by virtue of the fact that they make the point that uh, they had actually cautioned uh, that this was going to happen at a point in time. This is the man who was at the center of the controversy that unfolded to a certain extent on the dawn of 7 January, um, when the clerk of parliament was presiding over sitting and we saw the situation where there was the election of a new speaker. And we all saw what happened when the clerk uh, drew the attention of the house that he had received a document injuncting the Asin North MP from participating in any processes, including voting for the speaker. And um, the NDC side insisted that he can't be kicked out of the entire process. For um, those on the MPP side, they think that uh, to a certain extent, um, that position that they held mm -hmm. has been vindicated by what we saw with the judgment that came from the court yesterday. And um, they would want to see a situation where um, he's taken through the process and probably, um, you know, prosecuted for having held himself out as an MP all this while, and even having participated in the process that led to the election of the speaker. But for those on the NDC side, I think to a certain extent, um, after everything that unfolded um, at the Supreme Court um, in connection with this case and all, they saw this coming. They saw this coming. And so, um, repeatedly, the point had been made on their part that um, they will stretch this all the way to the Supreme Court, even if um, the MP is asked to exit and a rerun is done, they made the point that uh, they would be able to retain that particular seat. So it, it, it's been a bit of um, a back and forth. It, it's very much unclear for now if this may eventually come up for a real conversation on the floor itself. Mm. Um, 
and, and, and all, but we're waiting to see what will unfold in the day side. Curious question, was the Jomoro Member of Parliament uh, in Parliament yesterday, did you see her? I didn't spot the Jomoro Member of Parliament uh, herself um, in, in the House. Um, I was told by um, a colleague in the House that um, he actually spotted the um, Asin North MP that um, uh, John uh, Jache questioned around and that um, not in the chamber itself, but on the premises, uh, headed towards his office in the job 600 uh, building. I checked subsequently and he wasn't around in the office. Um, but today is one of the days that because it's a media review statement, um, virtually uh, all the MPs show up to come watch the process unfold. So we would so still we be have looking to look out for whether Mr. Chris will be around. Uh, uh, yes. Um, we're hoping he would be, you know, yesterday in the conversation with um, Roxy Nafiamakwa, who is a legal practitioner and an NDC MP, he made the point that um, until the court documents are served on him officially, he can continue to hold himself out as... Just like he did during the speaker voting. <laughs> <laughs> well, precisely, precisely. So um, you may never know, but you can be rest assured that if he does, his colleagues on the NPP side would want to point that out very strongly and demand that the speaker takes action to get him out. But mm. um, we wait to see how things unfold later today. Um, but just, I'm happy on the, yeah. the Jomoro situation quickly. Mm -hmm. the, the updates, the, the case is at the level where the petitioner is actually asking that uh, the MP makes available her renunciation certificate. And the MP's lawyers responded that, no, no way in our response to your petitioner, we said we had a renunciation certificate. So why are we being compelled to produce it? And so that is where it, it, it got to that the matter was taken to the Supreme Court. They wanted the Court of Appeal rather to take a second look at the court's directive that they should produce a certificate that they've not claimed it exists in the first place. But the judge still says the, the Court of Appeal didn't grant their request. And so it still remains that that renunciation certificate has to be provided at the level of the High Court. They and had so about 10 days to do questions. so, right? Yes, they had 10 days to do so. So people are still asking the questions that if the certificate is there, why is saying that if not said it's there, so it should not be compelled to bring it? Interesting. Uh, and then I was just going to ask you, uh, Akable, about the Techiman South. Yes, it's also one that has been battled. I mean, uh, we are told they're supposed to go back either, I think, today or tomorrow. Uh, that one, uh, the last points they had, uh, they had made, the, the discovery and all those things had, had actually been done. And so the court just have to give some further clarity, uh, directions as to how it intends to settle that particular matter. And, and that is also a very key issue because you know the NDC had insisted that their tabulation indicates that uh, their candidate won and not uh, Martina J. Mensakosa, who is currently in parliament going about parliamentary business mm. as well. So let me throw that to uh, Opokogako. Do you see that member of parliament? Yes, Opokogako. This is Joseph. He'll come and tell you later, he was always around. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, so Opoku Gakpo isn't with us, uh, you know, uh, at this point. So let's do my journal.com if the page is ready for us to run through. In the meantime, happy birthday to Bernard Jesse. Uh, Maloda of Kaswa Ion City is your birthday today. Happy birthday to you. And Golden Roses FC. So Bernard is with Golden Roses FC as well as from I call Sam and the squad. It's uh, your big day as well today, Mr. Charles Miracle of Prince of Peace Catholic Church, Kwashiman. And this is for my colleague here, Isaac Amo, to you. Enjoy your birthday. If it's your birthday today, well, happy birthday to, to you. Can we do my journaline.com right now, though? That's the page. Uh, government to present 2021 mid year budget review today. Uh, Cape Coast High Court cancels 2020 Ascent North parliamentary election results. On that same story, there are so many angles. Uh, so, for instance, the minority leader, uh, Harun Idrissa, says, we will contest this travesty of justice. And then there's Nana Boache, uh, who says NDC was very incompetent in managing their candidates. And then the Supreme Court prohibits Justice Ahonyanuga from continuing with the former Coco Board CEO's case. That's also quite huge, considering he had tried several times to get him off his back. Finally, 
he gets to breathe without him. I'm ready to testify, Mr. Chairman. This is also another brewing case where Al Hassan Suhini has been invited to testify in the Asin Central MP case. This is at um, the Privileges Committee of Parliament. So a lot of things around Parliament uh, this day, really. There's also uh, Professor Kweku Azan who says the court erred in interpreting the law and that they should have referred it to their mother, the Supreme Court. It was beyond them. We'll see how that goes. Still on the Senate, though, Sami Jemfi also says uh, the MP was qualified to contest election. There are so many questionings being directed at the vetting committee of the NDC itself that also did not raise issues, even though we're told that matter was brought to the attention. Perhaps they interpreted it differently, and that's why he was made to go through. But Ghana likely to witness severe third wave, even as we talk about the politics of the day, with all these other things. You need life to survive to enjoy the politics. So you have to pay attention to what the Ghana Health Service is saying, that Ghana is likely to witness severe third wave if safety protocols continue to be ignored. Uh, Joseph, just finally, there's uh, you know, a lot of talk also on the Chief Justice's issue with the petition to remove him because of the $5 million bribery allegation. You know. <laughs> Let's just wrap up with that. Any new developments? The, the latest is that, uh, Asef, I remember the last time we spoke about it, uh, the president had indicated that some processes were underway. Asefa has written to the presidency asking for details. They want to understand what the presidency means by processes. They want to find out whether a committee has actually been set up to probe the matter. If the committee has been set up, who are the members of the committee? And uh, when they are they sitting and what are they up to? Those are the details that uh, they, they wanted. So we are waiting to see what the response will be from the presidency to that effect. But already some are asking questions whether that petition really discloses any reasonable matter. And they're making reference to, there's, there's a case in the, um, around 2005-2006, there about uh, Frank J. Chum versus the Attorney General, where the court introduced a new angle to this whole process that requires the president, while consulting with the Council of States, to do a prima facie determination. And so they are also asking questions about whether that has actually been done because that is a, an, an important leg that you not find in the text of the constitution mm. but it's a position of law stated by the supreme court mm. as well so we also look forward to some clarification from this yeah opoko gako is this a matter of interest to our mps uh, well um for now not very much directly when the story okay uh opoko gako i beg you you need uh Joseph Akablay's operator to work on that internet of yours. So I'm afraid we have to leave because we can't hear you. It's like you're boxing. Can he say hello? Can he say hello? Ah, wow, look. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> That's Joseph Opokugako, who's our parliamentary correspondent. Joseph Akablay, please link him, eh? Even though yours is not even like 100%. Yours is like 60%, but it's better. All right. Uh, that's it for the review. Thank, thanks to you guys for helping out with the review. And thanks to you for following. Uh, Muftal is standing by. He's got sports and he's talking boxing. He's talking Olympics. And hopefully he's talking hats of folk. Stay with us. has become the career of Ghanaian promising boxer Wasiru Mohammed. Since winning that global super bantamweight title in 2019, he's since gone into obscurity. And this has led to him losing his title because he's been stripped off. We'll also be talking about Manchester United, whom yesterday Ketsu of goals from Elanga and Pereira secured a 2-2 draw against a newly promoted side to the English Premier League, Brentford, in their ongoing preseason campaign as they get ready for the Premier League season that starts on August 14. And this morning, Ghanaian swimmer Abeku Jackson will be in action in the Tokyo Olympic Games. I am Muftar Nabila Avlai, and this is AM Sports. 
on the AM show. Let's start with the career of promising Ghanaian boxer Wasiru Mohamed, who has been dealt a hefty blow. The talented boxer has been stripped of his WBO Global Super Bantamweight title due to inactivity. Wasiru has not fought since January 2020, and this has led to the organizers of the WBO Super Bantamweight title stripping him of the title. Now let's talk about uh, about that will happen on the 30th, and this one will be coming from the organizers of the WBO featherweight title that will be happening at the Buko Boxing Arena. And the organizers will be led by Samuel Enim Ado, and he's been speaking about how ready they are and how they intend to ensure that all the protocols in relation to COVID-19 are adhered to. Ghana is going to tell the whole world that Ghana, the next featherweight champion to come to the world, is coming. And this is the first stage for him as he's going to battle the champion, the reigning champion, Sebastian Nathaniel from Namibia. So to give you some few details, you, are, you know we are having a serious problem when it comes to COVID, which is a natural issue that no one can do anything about. The Almighty God is the only one who can tell us what it is. So we must all, and I'm happy you can see everybody is adhering to the COVID protocols. And let's remember at the venue, the protocols will be strictly observed and everyone is supposed to follow that because we don't want to have issues with government and authorities. And the, the next thing I can tell you is that you are going to have a very good show at the Bukum Boxing Arena. We are doing this this bout is bronze boxing promotions and Bukum Fist of Fury doing this bout. You have bouts on the bill that are also part of the Fist of Fury series that has been happening in this country, which is uh, Mr. Moses Fuamene is leading the team, and GBA is also part of the Fist of Fury, and other boxing um, um, authorities in the country are also part of the Fist of Fury project. So you can see great undercasts. That is all part of the Feast of Free Bows on the bill on that day. That is Friday at the Bukum Boston Arena. To tell you a little about the tickets, we have the popular stand where I would love to be, 20 Ghana cities. Now let's hear from the boxers who will be the center stage of this action and John Lai. He will be seeking to defeat Nathaniel of Namibia. He's a defending belt holder, and they've all been speaking big ahead of the fight that will be happening on July 30. Best coach in Ghana. Mental as you are alone, and yet if you quam, can get fake up with fake quam if enak 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 I can never remember Queen Say long. Me done team a French can coach yourself and me done with your motion. Can find say, yeah, yeah, I don't. This bet is coming to be my hood. No that night will change my life. No way. 36 minutes will change my life that night. No so this bet is coming to be my own. Yeah. Dance. Promoters, my trainers, uh, for, 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 for the spectacular uh, training camp that we had. I also want to thank the bo uh, uh, Boxing Gunners for the opportunity. I am ready to defend my title and I will successfully defend it. I'm ready. Uh, training camp has been amazing. So. 
Now let's talk about Wasiri Mohammed, and he won the WBO Global Super Bantamweight title in 2019. However, since January 2020, he's not been in action, and this has forced the organizers of that specific belt to strip him of the title. Here is president of the Africa WBO president in the person of Samir Kaptan. I think uh, our rule says when a boxer wins a title like today, Friday, if a boxer wins the title, we have a form to be filled that you have 120 days to defend the title. If you don't defend that, you'll be stripped. And I think all of you know, since Wasiru won the title, he hasn't defended both titles, the global and Africa. So he's been stripped. You know, I particularly heard about what is happening. You know, for my did happen, and present day I heard it last two weeks. You know, but I've informed the. He said he's he's not the manager. You know, but I informed Mr. John Marfo about it. Well, it's not only this boxer. It's not only Washu that this has happened to so many boxers. Not in Ghana alone, around Africa and around the world. This is our decision. The rules that we have. That if you win the title and you don't defend 120 days, and even if 120 days comes and you don't have a tangible answer, you know, to tell us, then that's that. But if you tell us maybe there's something wrong with you, maybe a doctor's report that you're not fit to defend at that 120 days, so they should give you more time. You have to apply so that we think about and give you more time. But nothing of sort came. He can get the second chance if his promoter applies with the new um, champion of his title. We can give him the chance because he's a good boxer. Thank you very much. Sir. So he shouldn't relent okay. and he shouldn't be disturbed, you know. But only, you know, I've been saying this thing you, the pressmen, are my witness. Samuel Captain, WBO president for Africa, speaking over there about Ghana's promising boxer. He actually rose to be the sixth best boxer in the world in that division. Unfortunately, he's been stripped of that title. Now let's talk about some football stories where head coach of Accra Great Olympics, Anwar Walker, is determined to build a strong squad for next season. Now, the Daddy Boys finished sixth in the just ended Ghana Premier League season, despite promising to finish among the top four clubs. And he says that he'll need to build a very strong squad for next season. But if I should uh, stay with Olympics, definitely I'm bringing on board players that uh, you will see and you'll be happy again. What are some of the positions you want to strengthen? My central defense is number one, very, very important. And my two keepers uh, are out. You know, yes, uh, Saeed is out, uh, Abi is out. So I'm left with only two keepers. So, and um, as for Abi, he will be out for so long. So if I should get him at all and the season starts, then I should get him in the second round. So I need at least two keepers for now, uh, till uh, maybe they are back. So that then my central defense, uh, as at now, I will say, you can see and yeah. you've been watching the yeah. mic. I have to plan of bringing. I have Oli Jamai and uh, Sechre. Sometimes when I want to do some change, I'll bring in Danso. Sometimes I'll bring in Amza. But I need complete central defenders who will play the position as central defenders. Beside, maybe I want to strengthen my striking role as well. My striking, you know, I have only Maswell, uh, Kwe, and uh, Manab, Mudasiru, then Yakubu. But Yakubu was, uh, when he came, he was a bit rusty. You know, when he came from outside, mm -hmm. he sat down for long. So before he could pick and come, the season uh, was getting to an end. The future of Anna Walker at Great Olympics is undecided. However, he continues to prepare. 
for next season. Now let's talk about West Africa Football Academy and their head coach is Postman Nati. In the course of the season, he lost arguably one of the best strikers in the Ghana Premier League in the person of Daniel Lomote and he replaced him with Sakandi Hazaka's player, Justice Tochiche. He's been speaking about the player whom he believes has got what it takes to build other players around him. When Lomuti left, we, we had a gap with respect to our max massive position. I mean, somebody to play as a number nine. So we're thinking through. So uh, we got a video from uh, somebody, uh, a scout, to go and look at uh, a player at second he has a case. So I was asked by the club to go and watch. So it was second he has a case versus Proud United at the Jendu Park. Mm -hmm. So the video, I watched the video, but he was not the one. So when I got there and they started the game, um, he just did a move without the ball. And that move without the ball is typical of quality strikers like Ronaldo's, the Crespo's, the Van Basten's, you can think of, like the Beatles. Those, 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 those are the, the type of strikers I see them execute such moves on the photo play. So when I saw it, I, I, I became attentive and tried to look if he could repeat the same act, that's the same movement without the ball. It's not Thank you for joining us for AM Talk. Uh, it almost sounds very familiar. Yesterday we were here discussing this matter, except that uh, today a judgment has been delivered. And as you know by now, the Cape Coast High Court, the High Court in Cape Coast has ruled uh, that there should be a rerun of the Asin North uh, election, the parliamentary election. Uh, so we continue with our conversation from yesterday. Christian Mamahese is a lawyer. He's joined me. I'll see if his position on the criminal aspect has changed. Good morning to you. Uh, Dr. Rashid Draman is also joining me. He's the Executive Director, Africa Centre for Parliamentary Affairs. So, gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Thank you again for making time. Morning. Um, Christian, I just want to ask you, uh, with regards to the criminal aspects of it, has your position changed from yesterday? Can you kindly mute so we can hear you when you speak? Unmute, I beg your pardon, so we can hear you. Yeah, it's not necessarily. Oh, your position has not necessarily changed? Yes, yeah, okay. it's not necessarily. Okay, all right. We will hear the arguments in a bit. Uh, Dr. Draman, any surprises there from the judgments? Yes. Um, I think for me the big surprise is the fact that the pronouncements that we had yesterday from the minority side uh, <laughs> seems to uh, be pronouncements that will set back the clock of uh, progress towards um, consensus building and trust between the majority and the minority. Okay, so sir, uh, why don't you hold your thoughts there? I'm sure you're referring to what Haruna Idrisu said. So let's refresh. Uh, our memories with comments by the minority leader of parliament, Haruna Idrisu. Here we go. The minority remain unshaken. We are confident that it is our seat. It will remain our seat. Our first is to use the same legal processes and legal forum and opportunities available within the constitution. We will contest the ruling. The judge erred both in law and in fact is a travesty of justice. But what is worrying, we don't want to believe that the courts of Ghana have been captured and that the courts of Ghana have become forums being used surreptitiously to tilt the balance of power. We are equal, 137, 137. What is happening is the courts now being used to tilt the balance of power and to weaken time-tested historical notion of checks and balances 
justice must not only be done, but must manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. What happened this morning in Cape Coast, we are told that even when the Supreme Court of Ghana directed the Honorable Quisin and his legal team to go and file appropriate legal motions for the matter to be referred to the Supreme Court, he was denied that. That is repugnant and an affront to his right to a fair trial guaranteed under Article 19 of the 1992 Constitution. Danger begins our democracy with the developments happening. But as I've assured you, we remain unshaken, we remain very resolved, and cooperation will suffer. Dr. Rashid Rahman, please go ahead. Yes, uh, Mamavi, I think two things from from there, uh, I think the press is what I was referring to earlier. The fact that um, this is likely to set back the, the clock of progress in terms of trust and consensus uh, on the face of it. I mean, even though um, if you think about it carefully, you would uh, perhaps have some hope that if the minority is going to be uh, very critical and is going to say that now we are not going to compromise, we are going to do our work um, according to the book, then it might be to the benefit of Ghana. We might see uh, perhaps oversight and accountability mm -hmm. being done uh, according to the expectations of, of Ghanaians. The second um, is the fact that, you know, we don't want to get to a point in this country where a very big constituency like the opposition party uh, not having faith uh, and trust in our judicial system, that is going to be very, very dangerous for our country. And I think a lot of work uh, needs to be done because you see, um, I'm not a lawyer, but when people begin not to have faith in the judicial system, that is what leads to um, I an mean, instant justice, people taking the law into their own hands, and so on. And maybe this is coming on the back of comments that we heard from the FEC uh, after the judgment on the a presidential election petition between the former president and the current president and the EC. If you remember, there were pronouncements then that, you know, in future elections, uh, NDC is not going to go to court. It's not going to rely on uh, the court system to settle any matter. Uh, what What is the meaning of that? And if you add that to this current happenings, as well as maybe some future happenings, because we still have uh, a lot of uh, um, issues in court regarding some MPs, particularly MPs from the minority side. Um, then we should all begin to get worried as citizens of this, this great country. Mm. Let me go to um, Christian Mam Hesse. Um, I'm sure that you've taken time to read the 64 judgment delivered yesterday do you have you know there are people who still are not clear uh, who say that particularly the article 94 2a should have been referred by the judge what what do you make of after reading it do you think that he should have i mean yes um where constitutional where in the course of proceedings or trial constitutional matters become a subject of controversy for, for the court to interpret. Um, in situation where the court is unable to put proper construction on it, then um, the parties must take steps to refer him to the APS court for interpretation and reversion back to that particular lower court. 
Okay, no, so I, I asked you, do you see that there was some kind of contention there? Yeah, I mean, there was a contention there, but um, it was inherent on the parties to have referred that particular um, um, controversy in respect to the construction of that particular provision to the constitution, um, to the APS court for interpretation. So that where the, where the parties failed to do that, then um, whatever interpretation that was placed on it um, in, in the course of the proceedings, um, the, it would only avail to them as, as a, a ground for appeal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I want us to take a listen to the majority leader uh, of parliament, uh, and then we'll also take a listen to Professor Kweku Asari, uh, who has uh, a few things to say. Here we go. Related to the ascent of Member of Parliament elect then. If you recall, there were dramatic representation even from our side. And we had questioned the implication of that decision for the member to sit in and be part of that decision making on that day. Each one of you will bear witness. And so today we have been vindicated because from day, day one we had made our point abundantly clear that the member was invalidly elected and lo and behold a court of proper jurisdiction has come to make a ruling now i respect the minority leader but for him to say that robin in government influence and the likes is totally flawed and should be rejected ab initio. We think that if you look at the provisions in our law, the pieces of legislation as well, applied. Article 94.2, Section 92 of the Representation Act, and then the Canadian Citizen Act, all put together, were the anchor of the ruling from the court. Now, be it as it may, any law-abiding citizen, when there is a court ruling and you don't agree in law, you need to file a review or go for an appeal. Don't bring in the executive. We have built our country to the extent that we need to rip, rip, uh, respect separation of powers because the honorable minority leader is part of the legislative arm of government. And the court is part of the judiciary. So if there is a court ruling and you don't agree, you go and appeal. That has been gazetted. And the bill purpose is to eliminate all these restrictions. Uh, Article 94.2a, Article 8.2. Citizenship Act 2000, Section 16, and then the Office of Special Prosecutor Act 49, Section 13. We have presented a bill that uh, intends to get rid of all these restrictions that include Ghanaians who have the citizenship of other countries. The thing that people do not realize with Article 94.2a is that it's not just about if you owe allegiance to a country other than Ghana, you cannot be an entity. But it is also about so many other things because I have a list here of things that you cannot do if you cannot be an entity. Mm. You cannot, for instance, be a minister of state. You cannot be a deputy minister of state. You cannot be a cabinet member. You cannot be a speaker of parliament. You cannot be a member of the electoral commission. You cannot be a member of the Public Service Commission. You cannot be a member of the National Commission for Civic Education. The question then is, what really is citizenship? What does it mean to say you are a citizen of Ghana? You are a natural-born citizen of Ghana. Mm. And you cannot be anything. Obviously, the, the, the scope of restrictions alone should alert us that we are misinterpreting Article 94 to 8. 
My understanding of Article 94-2A is that it applies only to naturalized Ghanaians or registered Ghanaians. This is the common sense approach that the Nigeria courts have used. The Nigeria courts insist that a natural born Nigerian cannot be excluded from the political space. So that's uh, Professor Kwekwaza on PM Express last night with uh, Aisha Ibrahim uh, talking about this particular provision, citizenship and allegiance. So clearly we need some kind of uh, assistance from the Supreme Court. But earlier you heard from Frank and not Dompre, who is majority chief whip in Parliament. So I'll come back to you, gentlemen, but I want to start with you, Dr. Rashid Draman. Uh, there were processes before... Uh, this national exercise, uh, which is that this member of parliament, who by the decision of the court yesterday cannot hold himself as a member of parliament uh, any longer, went through a process within the political party, the NDC, and I'm talking about the voting process. Uh, there was a petition that was also presented to the Electoral Commission, drawing the Electoral Commission's attention to the fact that uh, this former member of parliament now had dual citizenship. Um, who has failed us? And this question is on the back of the judgments as we have it today, irrespective of what the parties are saying. Just what you see. Who has failed? Um, I'm not too sure um, where, to, where to lay the blame. Uh, I know that, um, for instance, coming on the back of uh, the president um, in the Adamusa Kandi uh, matter many years ago, uh, all political parties uh, in our country uh, have taken steps to make sure that this is not repeated. And one of the things that I know, because I had a friend uh, who at one point wanted to run uh, um, for a seat um, in one of the political parties. And he had, I mean, in, again, uh, we are talking about Canada here again. He had Canadian citizenship. And he came to me and said, look, I need, I need help to get um, this citizenship renounced because my party says you have to bring a paper that shows that at least uh, you have taken the step. And one of the key steps is to go on the website of Citizenship and uh, Immigration Canada and fill in all the necessary documentation. And once you click OK, that means that the process is done. I mean, even if uh, maybe your certificate is not in your hand and so on. Uh, and I remember in the case of this, my friend, before <laughs> We went ahead to click OK, and this was done in my house. I asked him once again, are you sure that this is what you are going to do? Uh, he told me, yes, this is what I want to do. And he went ahead and, and did that. Eventually, he lost uh, I mean, in yeah. the primaries. He couldn't uh -huh. make it to parliament. But I'm saying this to say I don't know exactly uh, at which point. And Mamavi, if you look at maybe uh, the processes and the circumstances, uh, around this particular case. Uh, many have argued, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so let me be guided by what I'm going to say here. Uh, many have argued that, you know, we're dealing with exceptional circumstances. I mean, that uh, were brought uh, by the uh, breakout of the pandemic. And again, I had friends, uh, again, in Canada, because I have a very close association with Canada. I lived there for many years. I had friends and close uh, relations that that were waiting for some Canadian uh, um, papers at the time that the pandemic broke. And normally, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada says it takes 45 days. But when the pandemic broke, it took 120 days or so for I mean these, these processes to be completed. I mean, in that case, I don't think that it was the fault of this this uh, this particular friend. I mean, relation of, of mine and so. So I'm saying all this to say, look, where is common sense? 
in our legal processes. I mean, I don't know at which point we have to apply some common sense. Or should we always be just strictly interpreting the letter of the law? Uh, and I see uh, the legal brain here smiling. So maybe he <laughs> has a different, different view. And Mamabi, I also want to support the position of the professor that we had earlier. I mean, yesterday on your show, you remember I was telling you that this is a very bad law. I mean, if I had my way, this is one of the things that I will see repealed in the in this in this our constitution. Because look, when we are counting our blessings as a country, we count the blessings that come from the diaspora, the blessings that come from our citizens out of the country, and so on and so forth. Their contribution economically is hailed by our country. Uh, as well as many other countries around the around the world, and then when it comes to um, the political process, we say these people uh, have no space and cannot uh, contribute. I mean, look at the long list that that we had from the, the 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 professor. I think this is this is very very unfair. I mean, I was born in in, in Salaga, and assuming that I have uh, American citizenship, then. Tomorrow, somebody will tell me that I'm not qualified, you know, to play any political role in this country. I think that that is very unfair, and we seriously need to look at this, uh, I mean, as uh, a matter of fairness and a matter of justice. I mean, even if um, it's also a matter that has uh, often tilted the balance of political uh, power in this country. Mm. Let me turn my attention to Christian if he has anything to say. Yes, um, my few remarks remains that uh, this matter will definitely see the light of appeal. Uh, that's what I believe in. And mm -hmm. also a quick one to what uh, Doc said. I mean, we in, in law, we have what we mostly call the law, and we have another one called equity. And equity deals with um, common sense, like you said, in the least, in the least sense. Um, in this situation, just as I enunciated yesterday, um, we have a rule in a certain case called Milroy and Lord. It is a 17th century case, which established that equity will not assist. Equity will not assist a person who fails to perfect his gift. So that in this situation, um, that is what, the, or that was the posture of the court. Hello, Christian. We can hardly hear you now. We... Is that uh -huh. in 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 that in that in that seventeenth case? That's the Milroy and Lord case. The rule is that equity, the law will not assist. Um, someone who fails to perfect his gift so that that became the posture of the court as we saw in the judgment now um the situation is that as the mp failed the court deemed it that once the mp did not have the certificate even though he did everything within his uh, remit and legal obligation to show his intention to go through the statutory declarations required, um, once he didn't have the certificate, then that disqualified him. And that was the harshness of the law, the, that rule that I mentioned. Now, there came exceptions under that particular Milroy rule. <clears throat> and that exceptions meant that equity will perfect an imperfect gift in the situation and putting it in this context, where the person, so where the MP carried out all legal obligations required of him, but it was subject to a third party to complete it, that person cannot be held to say that he reneged on his obligations, but it is because the obligations bestowed on the third party, the, the innocent party as the MP, cannot repudiate those obligations. And more in the light of the pandemic, the court also ought to have taken what we call judicial notice. So that if the court was taking judicial 
roses. The court would have filled in the gap that the gap of the exceptions <clears throat> in equity. That's why I feel that this matter will definitely go to the Court of Appeal or probably even get to um, the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So definitely, equity comes in to fill the gap of common sense and consciousness. Yeah. Christian, what do you make of the uh, assertion that they tried to file some processes uh, right after the Supreme Court had struck out uh, that attempt to interpret the provision? but they could not find any court officials uh, in Cape Coast at the time when they attempted to, to file the processes. What do you make of that? I mean, the, the court is not on vacation yet. Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, um, it's unfortunate if that was the situation, but um, it, it, it would be one person's word against the other, uh, and, and, and little, little could, could be adduced from that. But the, the, the lawyers, the lawyers have a lot to do with respect to their legal options to 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 evaluate whether they would want to do review, which which I don't see likely. Uh, they would want to to go upstairs and and have have their legal submissions heard on the matters. And and these exceptions are what I see that their lawyers will be conversing strongly. Mm. We know that uh, Court of Appeal is the end uh, for parliamentary elections. You know, you only can go to the Supreme Court on matters of the uh, constitution, constitution, interpretation, exactly. Uh, so we wait to see. They've given all indication. They're obviously going to appeal this decision. But Dr. Rashid yeah. Rahman, you've continuously, and I think once we enter this eighth parliament uh, with the numbers, the equal numbers, except for this independence uh, MP, You've said that consensus is the way to go. Would this bring, and if you listen carefully to what Haruna Idrisu had to say, would this bring, would this change the dynamics in Parliament in terms of conversations? I mean, it hasn't been smooth, but would this even make it harder? Yes, it certainly will make it very, very hard, Mama V. Uh, as I said yesterday on your, on your show, um, just on, on Thursday, uh, on Tuesday, we had a, a forum in Parliament, and the goal of that forum was to try and see how we can try to reset the conversation between the two sides, because uh, I mean, trust is suffering, uh, consensus has suffered in certain instances uh, since the beginning of this eighth Parliament, and we left there very upbeat. I mean, thinking that we were making some progress. And the, and the two leaders, uh, for me, one question that I asked them at that forum was how do they want to be remembered by history uh, when we write the history of this eighth parliament, which presents uh, some very unique opportunities for, I mean, the two sides to work together because we never had, I mean, these kind of tight numbers. Uh, I told them that they should always think about how they want history to remember them history will not be fair to them if uh, these uh, unique opportunities, uh, these unique opportunities are not seized by them. And they promised that they were going to work together. They promised uh, to open a new page uh, and so on and so forth. And so now I think uh, this is certainly going to set set the clock, the clock back. But as I said, uh, in my earlier remarks, uh, I see some silver lining in, in this that you know sometimes too much compromise uh, can get in the way of of scrutiny and oversight maybe when they get too comfortable uh, as we saw during the vetting of of the, the the ministerial nominees many have argued that you know uh, perhaps the ndc took the positions um, that they took on a number of the the, the nominees at the time uh, in the interest of compromise, in the interest of making sure that our country moves on and progress is made. Uh, perhaps now we are going to see something different and we are going to see what uh, maybe many citizens are expecting, that look, the minority should be up and doing. Uh, don't block the work of government, but also make sure that you hold the government to account because as a business of the government is waiting mm. to hold the government that is in power to account for every action 
that it takes. Mm. Do, would you, would a, a possible criminal investigation following the court's ruling yesterday, um, you know, do anything to the work of parliament? Yes, indeed. I think uh, if we have criminal investigations, I mean, that is just going to add uh, uh, fire to the mix because uh, that means that perhaps the honorable member, uh, the ex-honorable member could not uh, stand for for um, uh, the, the seat when the, perhaps uh, nominations are open. And I believe that is going to anger the, the minority uh, more because, I mean, if uh, the president is anything to go by, criminal pro uh, proceedings are open. I am sure that um, this MP might end up, end up, uh, his fate might might end up being similar to to what Sakandi uh, faced. And you know, in this country, the two parties like uh, like to do uh, equalization. So I am seeing that. Uh, already we've had uh, party executives and capitals have filed some kind of proceedings and, and so on and so forth. I mean, but if you look at this particular case, I don't think it's the same like the case of Sakande. I'm, I'm sure that the lawyers would argue this out because in his case, he still held on to his British citizenship at the time. Uh, it wasn't like uh, he had done anything to uh, to uh, to revoke that citizenship. Mm. So there is. Some uh, minor difference. I don't know how significant that will be uh, when the criminal issues are, are examined. And Christian, just finally, should we blame as Ghanaians the Electoral Commission for not doing a good job, seeing as the attention uh, was drawn to the fact that uh, this former MP had a dual citizenship? Um, not so much. I, I believe that um, at the time the EC was notified of this, the EC in its license should have required um, the, 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 the honorable member to bring something from the court to indicate his validity to, to, to go through the process. I say that because the EC would not, because this had a peculiar situation and the EC could, have, could not have been in the proper position to put any interpretation on it, especially because the gentleman had renounced his citizenship and was only waiting for, 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 for the certificate. So the question in law... Um, Hello, Christian? Yeah. Yes. So the question in law is that, is renunciation enough? or is renunciation or renunciation um, awaiting certificate suffice for, for his candidature. So probably the EC could have referred the matter to court for the court to determine on it for the way forward. And the EC failing to do that is what puts some sort of um, a blame, a blame on the... Okay, uh, just when you landed, we're finding it difficult hearing you, but we'll leave it here. Christian Mam Hesse is a lawyer. Thank you very much for helping us with the legal aspects of this. Dr. Rashid Rahman, just before you go, uh, should we be blaming the Electoral Commission for not being competent enough? I don't know what the electoral law says. What are uh, just bringing a paper saying that, uh, yes, I mean, I have renounced my citizenship um, is enough, and maybe that's what the Electoral Commission looked at. Or uh, the law uh, is very clear, saying that you have to bring in, you have to bring a certificate. And uh, you know, Mamavi, on the day that uh, uh, we had the last uh, sitting of Parliament, I think you and I and uh, other MPs were on your platform uh, during a discussion in Parliament. Uh, if you remember that day, mm -hmm. I think that was in January. I mean, I, I interacted with two MPs from both sides. And, uh, and you know, both sides were very sure that they had a case. And, uh, and I remember the NDC side saying, you know, um, he did renounce the citizenship, and so there is no case at all there. 
and the MPP side saying, look, look at the date on which the certificate was issued. There is a case there, and this, this man is going to suffer. And I think uh, uh, fast forward six, seven months later, we are seeing the outcome of it. And uh, so I think uh, whatever it is, uh, whatever uh, the chief fall in terms of the blame and who did his work or who did not do his work, I think the, there is a clear message here that our constitution needs some retooling, and perhaps this is the time. On that note, I thank you for your time, sir. That's Dr. Rashid Draman, Executive Director for, uh, of ASEPA. Uh, Christian, thank you so much for your time as well. Well, uh, we will continue to talk about this, and I know that the conversation is still ongoing wherever, the social media, in your homes, in your cars, wherever. But we've got to move on because there's another matter in Parliament today. The Finance Minister is expected to present the mid-year review of the budget statements and economic policy of government and supplementary estimates for the 2021 financial year. The different perspectives of what the economy is today, what are the expectations of professionals who know a lot more about the economy than you and I. That is what we're discussing after this. Stay with us. All right, let's talk about mid-year budgets now. Let me introduce to you my guest, Dr. Lord Mensah, Senior Lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. Dr. Abel Texan will also join the conversation. He's an economist with the University of Ghana as well. Good morning to you, Dr. Lord Mensah. Thank you for your time. Yeah, good morning, Mawabi, and good morning to our viewers. Great. I want to start on the back of data that was released by the Bank of Ghana this week. We know that private sector is not doing well. But they're also burdening private sector. Uh, we're supposed to be recovering, but that recovery is very slow. Give me your analysis of where we are today. Yeah, obviously, we should expect that private sector growth will be slow um, in a sense that you know, the private sector thrives mostly on a global input. And global input means that we should have you know, some of their production um, feeds from outside the country. And looking at the COVID and then the happenings around the globe, you can clearly um, see that um, production for some of the raw materials that will be needed by the private sector, you know, has stalled. And then also uh, production has stalled because uh, mostly um, those who are producing will be careful because they don't know the response of, of the third wave that we're going to have. But on our local market, let's look at, you know, the interest levels in this country, whether it is going down and how it is feeding into, you know, credit to the public. As we speak now, I think a typical Ghanaian investor will be confident to lend to the government rather than extending credit to possibly a typical you know, private man. And so um, the government treasury bills for some time now has been slow in coming down. I was expecting the trajectory that we started moving on would have been somewhere around 11% now, so that it can, you know, help the private man to borrow from the, you know, the bank at a lower cost. On the other hand, let's look at the liquidity of the banks, whether they are liquid enough, even though interest rate has shown some, you know, um, direction in coming down, but then in the end, that the bank has money to lend to the private sector as we speak now. So effectively, 
all these things are factors that are likely to affect you know the private sector growth and for me as i sit here it's not something that um, i'm surprised at but let's look beyond you know the COVID. even though the the the, the third wave has started showing up for which we have to be careful you know how we make our projections um simply because we don't know the toll that a third wave will take on especially on the african countries and if you ask me i would say that yes we have to be careful how we project you know for the private sector but i'm not surprised you know the growth is i mean quite slow in in the sector let me turn my attention to Dr. Ebo Texing now. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us as well uh, on this conversation on the back of the media uh, budget today. There's revenue shortfall. Uh, GRA is not collecting much. Uh, and, and so here we are today with the situation with the COVID as well. I mean, what, what do we expect that the GRA will do? I mean, they... they there was a, a description of how sluggish it has been, but that's expected because of the situation we find ourselves in. What yes, you uh, thank you. Mm. Um, good morning to your, your viewers and your listeners. Yeah, um, usually the first year, um, the first half of the year, revenue collection has always not been good. So um, it's not something that we, we shouldn't ex expect. Apart from that, um, all our projections of revenue was based on a sort of recovery from the pandemic and the expectation that the private sector was going to uh, get back to business as usual and then the government is able to collect taxes. The problem is that the recovery in the first half of the year, though it looks very promising, has not been what we expect. But I don't think that we should raise any cause for alarm now, given that our projections of even oil revenue was based on a lower uh, world oil price. And now we have oil prices going above what we expected. So um, I don't think that the total revenue that will come to government would be severely affected by what is happening. But then again, in the second half of the year, depending on how well we, we cope with the pandemic, I should expect that the revenues would, 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 would increase to make up for whatever shortfalls we are having now. Don't forget that um, the government clearly indicated that because of the Ghana card and then the tax and education numbers, um, they cannot identify a greater number of Ghanaians who potentially um, should be paying taxes. Um, I think that was the, the, the what we are all talking about, and that's the the step in the right direction because what it's going to do is now going to allow government to pursue those who are supposed to pay taxes for them to pay. So, um, yes, the private sector has not picked up as we expected, but I mean, with the case of our Tampa program, especially this phase that we are going into, or we should be in by now, we expect that things will pick up, and I, I, I don't think that we there's too much cause for alarm mm. regarding that. Yeah, but don't if forget we, yeah. IMF has. After that consultation, giving a thumbs up for the management of the COVID and the policies that have been put in place by this government to try to recover the economy. And they clearly give them a thumbs up for doing the right thing, hoping that in the next two to three years, our economy should be back to where it was at the pre-pandemic level. Don't forget that by the time the pandemic and we are doing so well in terms of the macro indicators. So <clears throat> we need to pray that the third wave doesn't get out of hand. And that is why every Ghanaian should try as much as possible to observe the safety protocols, because if it gets worse, then you are going to go back to what we went to last year. And that is even going to slow down our recovery uh, that we expect. Mm. I like the, the reminder uh, that you give. There are a lot of things that we've put in place, but if private sector is not doing well, then we, we still can't pay enough taxes. We'll still be below the targets. Yeah, precisely. I mean, so um, that is why if you look at the case of our Tampa program, the private sector is key to that, that revitalization of the economy and then the, the recovery. And I, I think that 
whatever support that they need, uh, the government should, should give to them. What is important to note is that um, the policy rate hasn't increased for some time, and we are just hoping that with the expectations of what inflation is going to be, because as we speak, it's, it's within the target. We are going to have a situation where interest rates are not going to increase too much. And I'm also very critical is the fact that the government has clearly indicated the setting up of a national development bank. Although it might not necessarily be a bank that would be offering um, a direct support to the private sector, I think that in terms of support to the light manufacturing industries that we are hoping the private sector to take the lead, there will be some support for them. And then secondly, also um, the fact that indirectly the National Development Bank is going to fund some of our infrastructure is also key. The digitization should help our private sector uh, to be able to recover faster in terms of business processes and all of that. So in the cost of doing business, we are able to bring that down a little bit. I think that the private sector should be able to rebound and, and, and get our economy moving. I, 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 I won't, as I sit here, um, have any pessimistic view of this economy. The economy is, is going to recover, and I think that uh, what is happening currently is something that we should be excited about. Okay. Dr. Lord Mensah, do you see the supplementary budget announcing additional measures, if you like, uh, to show up revenue mobilization? Yeah, I think uh, some structures have been put in place, and I'm expecting that they will feed into the review. Um, we could see on the ground um, most of the ID cards um, that we have have been, you know, um, merged together in a way to enhance identification of uh, businesses and their locations to mobilize, I mean, revenue as needed. But then as to how we will go, I mean, depends on how aggressive and the posture of the review. Um, because uh, if you take um, the budget that was read for this year, um, we were targeting a deficit of about, you know, minus uh, um, 9.5. And um, I believe 9.5, I uh, mean, percent of our GDP. And I believe that if we go in that regard, then it means we must, you know, find a way to finance, you know, that gap. And we live in a country where, you know, if you take our grant, the ESLA and SNIT NHL revenue that we, we generate, if we take the oil revenue, if we take non-tax revenue, they are all swallowed or covered by the uh, just interest payment. And so you ask yourself, you know, how we're going to maneuver through. But then the trajectory that we, 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 we picked um, from the beginning, uh, looking at the taxes that we repackage and then reintroduce. I'm not expecting the finance minister to introduce, you know, new taxes or repackage new taxes. I will want to see a review where the taxes that were introduced will continue in that manner. And then also, if you look at the, 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 the various structures of our revenue mobilization, you will realize that um, uh, bringing those ID cards together might have effect or might enhance our revenue, but it might not necessarily be immediate. And so we have to be careful how we, we bank our hope on all this. I remember, in as much as our oil is generating revenue for us, we also import oil, and global oil prices have started going up. And in effect, um, if we should look at our export and then our import of oil, the net effect might, even if we don't take care, might end up being zero. So we cannot bank our hope so much on the oil. So um, if you ask me, I want the, the, the review where the, the, the finance minister will be uh, more or less um, a bit conserved in terms of projections, taking into consideration the third wave of the, of the, of the, of the COVID and um, its likely impact. Mm. Dr. Texan, are you expecting additional taxes or levies to be imposed? No, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think the government should be insensitive to do that. Um, it's, it's important that we note that in the face of the 
the the the um, increase in oil prices. I understand that we import oil, but if the government is not subsidizing our oil imports, then for government fiscal policy, a higher in, increase in, in, in oil prices means um, uh, more oil revenue. So, so as far as government is not subsidizing our imports of oil, then I don't think that um, the importation of oil should be an issue when you talk about government fiscal policy. What is important is that we need this economy to recover. The taxes that were introduced ha has had its impact in terms of uh, um, increasing goods and services. Um, this is not a time the government would be insensitive to do anything of that sort. I expect that with the new database that they have on the potential number of persons who should pay income taxes, I think that in this second half, there should be an aggressive revenue mobilization to get those people to pay their taxes. That is key to enhancing revenue mobilization in this country. And it's important that we start now. Now, all of these would also depend so much on how we do the pandemic. And it's quite, it's quite important that we take a look at that. So far, we are expecting cocoa and some of our, of our exports to have an increase in prices in terms of not increased revenue in terms of the good harvest that we are expecting this year from our cocoa. So externally, we don't have too much of a problem. Our city is relatively stable. It is just a revenue mobilization, which is key. If you are able to mobilize enough revenue, I think that this government should be able to move the economy to the pre-pandemic levels in about two years' time. But of course, I do not expect them to impose any new taxes. And um, it's not something that this government would, would do. Now, we should also take a second look at the issue of the, the pandemic and the production of the vaccine. I think it's also very, very key. If we get enough vaccines and we are able to get as many Ghanaians as possible vaccinated, I think that it would remove away the uncertainty with the third wave of the pandemic. And so it will give confidence that if Ghana is able to move in that direction, then we should be able to have some um, assurance that in future we are not going to go back to what happened last year. I think these are all key to our recovery, but I would not expect the government to introduce any new taxes. Mm. Um, well, Dr. Lord, and, and yeah. Importantly, I should think that um, the, the, the infrastructure that we need to reduce the cost of doing business is key to this recovery effort. And so I'm hoping that whatever extra revenues that we make from oil because of the increase in oil prices should go directly into expanding our productive capacity so that um, the private sector can enjoy a much lower cost in terms of doing business in Ghana. And that could be an attraction for other multinational companies to come into Ghana to do business. Don't forget that our free SHS is leading to a situation where we are improving on the um, human capital that we have. And don't forget that any industrialization efforts is normally built on improved skills of the labor force. And these are all signals that go out to the world that Ghana is doing something both in terms of the human capital development and in terms of other infrastructure. So um, we should hope that the government would look more at expanding the, um, the base and then getting more people into the into the tax database and then aggressively supporting the GRA with logistics to go and pursue those who are supposed to pay taxes and collect those taxes. Okay, so now I want to speak the I, I want to speak, you know, local people's language now. If the people down there are not doing well, then you can expand all you all you want, but they still will not be able to give you. No, I mean when you expand the economy, what it means is that People are getting into jobs because you are creating an environment for the private sector to thrive and create jobs. The more people get into jobs, no matter what, they are going to pay income taxes. So that in itself is the way to go. Now, yes, times are hard now, but it was a difficult choice that Ghana had to make, given the choices that we had available to us. Do we go and borrow to keep on piling out our debt and then reduce, uh, not increase taxes? I'm not saying that an increase in taxes will assure more revenue. But if you look at the sort of increment that 
occurred in, especially in the petroleum taxes. Some of them were geared towards solving some of our debt issues, like our financial sector and then our energy debt. That was also key because they are all part of our debt. And so if you're able to get all of this away by having to pay more for fuel and those other uh, things directly that we are paying for, I think that in its own way, we are trying to do something about our debt. At the same time, also supporting government in this revenue effort to be able to mobilize enough revenue to support what the financing we need in our economy, especially mm -hmm. with regards to capital expenditure and others. So there were difficult choices. And the average Ghanaian, yes, um, if it's suffering, it doesn't, you, you think that the expansion doesn't matter. But it matters a lot. I what? mean, if you look at the what happened with the pandemic and the the fact that certain sectors of the service industry were severely affected, you also open up opportunities for delivery and other digitization efforts that have come up, that you are now having very young men and women moving into that space mm. and making some income out of, mm. out of that space. Mm. We need to take a second look at that sector as well, because there are a lot of opportunities in that sector that we can tax okay. to add up to revenue. So these are, these are how we should expect the expansion to help government to raise more revenue. Okay. Still on expectations uh, from this statement, uh, Dr. Lord Mensa, we talk about inefficiencies in the public sector and the fact that it continues to slow down the pace of the rebound. Any specifics that you expect to hear from the finance minister with regards to this matter? Yeah, I mean, effectively, um, the public sector is uh, part of the, I mean, the chain as far as our economic production is concerned, and we can't take them out. So um, with the finance minister coming to public as we speak now, um, public sector inefficiencies um, has to do with the systems that you put in place to ensure that whatever you know, labor input we have, we can have a very good output to improve on the, you know, um, the inefficiencies that um, we have. Now, if you take, you know, the investment that we've been doing in the past, you ask yourself um, whether we've been investing in systems that will improve, you know, efficiencies in the public sector. You know, you should understand the orientation of the current administration. We cannot roll out, we cannot dissociate policy, you know, target to whatever, you know, direction the economy takes. Um, you realize that the current administration has been targeting social investment, you know, over the years. And I believe that we've not concentrated so much on uh, much input or investment that will enhance you know, public sector um, delivery. And so I'm expecting in this budget that uh, at least a bit of concentration should go in that direction um, when it comes to the reallocations that we're going to do so that we can realize some, you know, um, efficiencies um, in that sector. So it is important for uh, much concentration when it comes to uh, some of the allocations we're going to do in the second half of the year. Great. And I, I, I want to come to you, Dr. Texting, on the issue of high interest rates, uh, increased borrowing. What do you specifically want to hear from the minister? Say. Um, I, I expect to hear the minister uh, tell us about how we are going to be able to sustain our debt levels at the current rate. Don't forget that the World Bank, has, IMF, has projected about 83% GDP ratio at the end of this year. And it's important that the minister is able to roll out its intended borrowing over the next half of the year and to let Ghanaians know what those amounts that we are going to borrow are going to be used for. I don't have any problems if you are going to use that for capital expenditure. It could be for to support human capital development. It could be to uh, provide support for, for, for infrastructure, both soft and hard infrastructure. What is key is that we are going to create more jobs. And don't forget that there is an expectation of creating one million jobs. The, I expect the minister to let Ghanaians know how whatever the government intends to do to support that objective of creating those one million jobs. I think that 
that is key in, a, in, in, a, in, in the second half. What is also important is for the government to clearly come out with what has happened over the last four years in terms of how much Ghana has borrowed and what is being used for. I hear people say that we have nothing to show for how much we borrowed, but I mean, right from 2012 to, I think, before the COVID, I think that Ghana had done some very useful uh, infrastructure um, uh, projects that would take time to have this impact. I think at times our expectations of some of these interventions and how quickly they should transform to the economy is too high. It takes a while. Is it our expectation or is... support that are needed to... Yeah, sorry, I was just uh, going to say, is it... support industrialization and so on and so forth. Yeah, I was so just, I was just going to say, yes. uh, Dr. Texana, is it our expectation or the promises given to us? So, for instance, if you take the president's promise of hospitals, he gave himself some 36 months. Uh, that's the promise. We expect that it should be done. Precisely. I mean, I, I'm not saying that Ghanaians... I'm saying that at times our expectations are so high based on how we expect some of these interventions to, to make an impact. I'm not talking about the political policies that are made on, 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 on political platforms and so on and so forth. For me, I'm talking about the analysis of the economy and how we should expect some of these things to play out. Yes, I understand. We should hold the government to its promises. But our expectations of how soon some of these things will have an impact on our daily lives. It's too high. It takes a while. I mean, some countries took four decades for them to see the impact of some of the very good things that were done in their economies to take place. I'm not saying that we should expect four decades, but what I'm saying is, is that there has been a lot of additions to infrastructure from 2012 to 2020. And these are key sets of infrastructure that should enable Ghana to expand its economy. You talk about energy, you talk about um infrastructure like the interchanges that we are doing, the roads that we are building, even in terms of addition to school infrastructure and all of that. These are key infrastructure that are very relevant for, for development. And so I do not expect that we should think that once the roads are built and all of these things instantly, we should look at the promise that this infrastructure that are put up holds for the private sector to find it very conducive to, to invest and expand their productive act activities within our domestic economy. Government can only provide the environment for the private sector to thrive. And I think that is the key of this government to let it be a private sector-led development process. So we need as much as possible to see how we support the private sector and also to get the private sector the needed support in terms of even finance to help them to expand and then create more jobs. Okay. It is key that we create jobs for our youth. It is key that we create a type of jobs that would also depend on the endowment that we have as a country that is endowed with agricultural resources. That is why the 1D, uh, 1F is key to whatever we are trying to talk about now, as well as other initiatives and agriculture and so mm. on and so forth. All right. I so, um, that, that is why, how we should look at things. Okay. We should look at not the immediate impact, but look at how the future will hold for us if the sort of policies we put in place now would, would continue. Okay, uh, I appreciate that. I'm just also thinking that, uh, you know, you would have more confidence if you see how it starts. Then, you know, you can, you can tell yourself that, oh, this is how it is beginning. So then I can have a lot more hope for the ending. But I want to ask you, Dr. Lord Mens, on the issue of, high interest rates, particularly on government securities, and increased borrowing, what are your expectations? Yeah, I think um, in this uh, second half, I'm expecting, you know, the finance minister to tone down his appetite for borrowing. I believe that, you know, um, in the past, the trajectory that we've been, you know, following in our borrowing, it, uh, it, it comes to concern. I do, I mean, um, accept, you know, my senior um, uh, analysis that, yes, uh, we've borrowed and we still have some, you know, infrastructure in place. But the question is, does those infrastructure that we have commiserate, you know, the debt levels that we are accumulating? And so going forward, I'm, I'm expecting that at least we should tone down, you know, our borrowing and go back to the drawing board 
commission a certain kind of um, review from 2007 that we became active on our borrowing, both domestic and international. Look at the funds that has come into this country. Of course, I appreciate that uh, most of the time when we are going to borrow, uh, we borrow to defray you know, existing debt. But then we add on that the rest of the funds will be, you know, will come to the environment to come and what? Be invested in a capex. So let's, let's go back to the drawing board and then look at the structures that we have, whether it can really stand by itself if we should, if we should freeze borrowing and allow those assets to start generating cash flows to pay for the, those debt. And so the question will be that uh, we've not commissioned those research yet, but then I believe that whatever will come out will be a, a negative thing to look at. So um, it's, 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 it's of a concern to look at our debt. So going forward, I think um, when we went to the IMF, you know, they gave us uh, certain conditions and those conditions, we shouldn't have deviated from it completely. Now, IMF, when they came, they indicated that we should borrow, we should um, have a budget deficit, you know, over the years within 5% um, of our GDP. But then suddenly, immediately we moved out of IMF, we started, you know, increasing our, our, our budget deficit, which is causing the borrowing. You know, I see, um, you know, when we, anytime we read budget and uh, we, we create a huge deficit, um, it seems like there's a business in there for somebody. And that is why, you know, possibly we keep on moving in that, you know, trajectory. And let me be plain. Um, um, I think going forward, I'm expecting the finance minister to slow down. Because there was a reason why IMF, you know, um, gave us that 5%, you know, discipline. And we could have kept that for some years, you know, before we, 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 we looked at the economy, assessed what we are capable of doing before, I mean, we, 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 we will start moving it upwards. But look at 5%, and then suddenly we started jumping around 11%. Um, the last budget that was read, you know, in November, which we, 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 we were expecting some downward trend, it even came to 9.5%. And that is where the borrowing is. And so I'm um, going forward, looking at our debt levels being of a concern. And if you take, you know, the outline of our, um, what we call it, revenue generation, and then you take just interest payment alone. The interest payment is about 35 billion and over. If you combine our grant, ESLA, all those VATs that we collect, including even our own revenue, it will not catch up with that, uh, what we call it, uh, 35 billion interest payment. So any prudent management at this level will personalize the budget and ensure that, you know, we, we, we tone down our borrowing so that we can stay afloat. You know, together with all this COVID happenings, third wave, having this Delta, you know, version of it, we we'll very soon will move to Epsilon. And because when the virus gets here, it will mutate and get to a different level. And we'll get to Epsilon, you know, kind of uh, a virus. And, you know, we might not have our way out. So I want the finance minister to tone down the borrowing. Simple. Uh, let, me, let me come in uh, with uh, a slightly different opinion with what my colleague uh, Lord Bresta is saying. Ghana has to come to terms with the fact that by the nature of the structure of our economy, um, we can do our best to bring down the deficit, but the competing needs that we have as a country to develop our country will make it almost impossible for us to, to, to shed ourselves of borrowing now. I mean, the president has indicated that we are looking beyond A, but we have to put in place all the sort of infrastructure, all the sort of support and expansion that we need to get to that point. In the meantime, we still have to borrow. If you look at the facts on the ground, there is no doubt that we should get worried about the level at which our debt stock is growing. But before the pandemic, the debt to GB ratio has been projected at 4.7%. It was something that we were going to achieve, but for the pandemic. So I will not agree that we are over budgeting, and I will not also accept an analysis that is critical of our deficits in 2020. All things were not normal. No country in this world is talking about deficit in an era of a pandemic, where government was expected to support households with, with interventions that was going to help them 
to at least reduce the burden of the pandemic. Government also had to rely on less than expected revenues because of the lockdown and other factors. What is the alternative that government has to do? The government is trying to get around some of these things by tax. I mean, the alternative is, 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 is just to tax, collect more revenue, or borrow. And I'll go on saying that insofar as you are going to borrow for capex, capital expenditure, I have no problems with that. Because the economy would expand in future. And if you look at the IMF report kindly, they indicate that with the sort of things that are going on now, they expect that from 2024, we are going to have a decline in our debt to GDP ratio because the policies that are put in place now are policies that are going to expand our economy, making more revenue, and our debt to GDP ratio, our fiscal deficit would, would fall, for our debt to GDP ratio to also fall. I mean, it is easier said when you are out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, government should stop borrowing. Government should stop. What is the alternative? Okay. As we put in place structures to get more people to pay taxes, this is a, a problem with sub-Saharan Africa. It's part of the structure of our economy. Mm -hmm. Our informal sector is very large. It's very difficult for us to tax the informal sector without having to put in place structures mm. and reforms to get everybody on board. Yeah. And so the alternative is, is very limited. And I would not blame any government that would say that, look, if you are collecting revenues to to expand or incorrect expenditure, let us go and borrow. And if you look at the government's debt reports that it publishes every year, they clearly indicated that they were making efforts to replace some of our high cost domestic debt we let it be cheaper and longer term mm. finance, external finance. Okay. These are all ways in which you can look at the debt, change your, the profile of your debt, and make it easier for you to service it. And in these times, I don't think that our, 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 our caution should be that let's limit on our, our, our borrowing. Yes, it's important that we let the government be aware. We so I, so I, I, get the, I get the sense that if, if, if I get, that should be key. I, I get the sense that issue for you yeah. even now Pardon? no i i'm just Pardon? just i'm just saying that i get a sense from what you're saying that more borrowing isn't an issue for you now because as you say there are limitations is it that you do more taxes you call it more revenue which we're not doing anyway uh, and so yeah. borrowing is not an issue for you of course not. i mean it's not okay. an issue for me all right uh, what is important for me is expanding you see it's the, our, our debt stock as a percentage of our GDP. When our GDP expands, our debt to GDP ratio will come down. Okay, all right. Our revenues will increase. Our revenues should increase, and therefore we we'll tend to get more fiscal space to 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 service the debt. Okay, I appreciate that. to be how we recover our economy to expand it. Okay, I appreciate and, that. And for it, if we are going to borrow to expand the productive capacity of our economy, create jobs, and tax people to pay. Okay, thank their, you very, their, thank their, you very their, much. Their income taxes. Thank you, Dr. Ebotexing. I'm just wrapping up in some 30 seconds, uh, and I beg your pardon for this, Dr. Lord Mensa. Uh, we're obviously not collecting more. Uh, we say things are hard, so we shouldn't expect more taxes. So we have no choice than to borrow. Well, uh, for me, I'm not saying the government should freeze borrowing completely. What I'm looking at is to slow down the borrowing. If you look at you know, our debt sustainable, sustainability issues, you clearly understand that the speed at which we are borrowing, right, is higher than the speed at which economy is growing. Let's look at the speed. So if you, you take the speed into consideration, the momentum that we've gathered in our borrowing compared to the momentum that, you know, our economy is growing, you realize that obviously we are borrowing faster than we are growing the economy. Okay. And anybody will tell you that once you, you pick that pace and the trajectory is getting, especially in African countries, your uh, debt to GDP is hitting around 75% and all those, it will be the time to tone down your borrowing. Okay. I'm not saying government should freeze you know, its borrowing. All now right. let's look at the fiscal support that we had during the COVID that you know, we, we, we seem to um, say that it, it has grown our debt. Now, fiscal support, countries were providing fiscal support most of the time from their buffer. As a poor country like Ghana, 
you don't provide fiscal support for six months when your what do we call it your 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 reserve you know foreign reserve can cover up to four months in case you know you should go you know off board well said so for me, on that we, note we should, though we should we should we should i mean look at the economy okay all right. Uh, Dr. Lord Mensah, Dr. Ebotek Singh, I know there's an appetite to come in again, but uh, this is where we have to leave it. So I guess we have to wait and have a conversation after the delivery of that statement in Parliament. Advertised time, though, is 12 p.m. today. So we have to wait a little longer for that presentation. That will be it. Thank you, gentlemen, for the two perspectives that you bring to this conversation. IB is coming up next with some show business news. Stay with us. And you're welcome to the show, as is the entertainment segment on the AM show. The name is Ibrahim Benbako, and you are just about to be driven into the world of entertainment. And yesterday marked the 200th anniversary celebration of the Republican of Peru. Well, it was their, uh, their Independence Day. And the, here in Ghana, they marked it with an event on Ligon campus. So the event was the Ghana Art Peru Contest. Well, the event was held at the Maison Francaise located on the University of Ligon campus, and it was attended by several dignitaries, including His Excellency Abel Antonio Carderas Tupia, who is the ambassador of Peru to Ghana, His Excellency Enrique Escorza, Mexican ambassador to Ghana, His Excellency Pedro Luis de Pena Gonzalez, who is the Cuban ambassador to Ghana, and Mr. Sam Zaka from the Honorary Consulate of Peru in Ghana, Dr. Joan Buampong, who is a director of Center of Latin American Studies, also on the University of Ghana. Well, I was there, the cameras captured. I had an interview with Dr. Joan Buampong, Mr. Zaka, and the ambassador himself. And they explained further what the art competition is all about, what the winners stand to gain, and the fact that they're going to be making this a yearly event. The Peru Art Contest is a contest that is conceived to have um, young people between the ages of 25, you know, come up with some artwork to depict what they perceive Ghana-Peru friendship to be. It may be something that they know or their perception of it. So it's perceived as a way for Ghanaians, young Ghanaians, because of course, in order for them to you know, write about friendship between the two countries, they will have to do a little bit of research. They will need to just find out, you know, what Peru is, what's, you know, some commonalities and stuff like that. So the idea is that we get young people thinking about the friendship that exists between this country or that could exist between the two countries. And it's all part of bringing an awareness about uh, for the people of Ghana to Latin America, Latin American countries, and the kinds of um, um, you know um, the kinds of bonds that exist between us. I just want to know how important is art going to fester a relationship between Ghana and Peru? Well, I mean, there's uh, great importance in art. Number one, uh, both countries have a lot of art and culture traditions, and we believe that uh, bringing the beauty of both cultures, both Ghana and Peru, but especially now Peru because we are celebrating our 200th anniversary, is, uh, is quite important. And that showcases uh, what Peru can do, what uh, are the opportunities in the arts and culture, uh, especially among the youth, because it, uh, it broadens up, you know, knowledge, it opens up ideas, and it helps, you know, people from both ends of the continent to, to see and appreciate what arts and culture has to offer. You know, as a matter of fact, the Embassy of Peru is really excited because of many things. The first one is because to today we are celebrating 200 years of independence of my country, of Peru. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that with, uh, along with the University of Ghana and the Honorary Consulate of Peru here in Ghana, we are launching this event, which is an art contest that is going to help us know each other a little bit more. The idea is that this art contest is going to be about the friendship between Ghana and Peru in this framework of the 200 years of our independence. The whole idea is to get to know each other a little bit better, so we begin a cooperation path in order to see if we can develop things, you know, learning from each other and getting to know each other a little bit more. 
how long is this going to be? Because I know this is the first of its kind, this art competition. This is, this is we are we are planning to have this yearly. So this is the first year because this is the launching. But from now on, on every year we are going to have a contest like this one, and it's going to be on the same time. We are going to launch it on uh, July 28th by our Independence Day, and it's going to be until November. November. The idea is that we are going to have to, uh, prizes depending on the on the kind of art you are going to present. If you are into, let's say, manual arts like painting, drawing, sculpture, you know, things like those, you have three prizes. The first prize is going to be $300, the second $200, and the third $100. Okay. And then we have also the literature part in which we also have three prizes for prose and also uh, poems, right, if you would like to make a poem. So the same, the same thing, the first prize gets $300, the second $200, and the third $100. And we are also going to give some special things for the 10 first uh, uh, posts of every one of the contests. And at the end, we are planning to make a small exhibition of all the paintings and all the arts that are going to come, you know, in order for people to see what they have done and, you know, to motivate them as well in this, in this path. Well, there you heard from Dr. Joanna Buampong, who is the director of Center of Latin American Studies in the University of Legon, Ghana. Mr. Sam Zaka, who is the honorary consulate and also the ambassador himself. Well, let's move on to see what is happening in the gospel fraternity. Well, John Winner, who is a gospel or an urban gospel musician, says, apart from him being a minister and a gospel musician, he's also a businessman. And every time he goes out there to shoot a music video, it is simply because he's looking for investors to come and invest in our music industry. All right, I'm a, I'm, apart from music and ministry, I'm a businessman. All right, so I try to get other brands to marry my brand. Oh, okay. Basically, the videos I shoot sells other pr products, all right? I'm looking at product placements. I look at very important things, not just doing the music out there. So anything you see in my videos, I'm promoting one brand or the other. All right, and traveling out there is, of, of course, just looking for investors to come here in Ghana to, you know, to push. You know, because uh, uh, music is a major export, all right? from Ghana to the diaspora. So if we can create that mileage and lift the flag of Ghana with our talents and our gifts, sure, then we can equally get people who will be interested in our craft and what we do to also come here to do certain investments. Of course, the industry needs major funding. So yes, of course, we, as we're going around, we're selling what we're trying to sell and let people know what we've got as Ghanaians and our local indigenous music blended with a Western touch and everything. That's, for me, the urban gospel thing. So we're trying to create we are trying to be a bridge between some place and some place. Yeah. And Ghana is a pivot. Yeah. Okay, that was John Winner, and that will wrap it all up for the entertainment segment here on the AM Show. Thanks, Ivy. It's a happy birthday to you, Bernard Jesse Maloda of Kaswa Ion City. And Golden Roses FC is from Derica Cole Sam and the squad. Enjoy your birthday today, Bernard. And just to tell you, Benjamin Akapo, I miss you. Get back soon. That's it for our show. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.